Brilliant. All right. Well, welcome everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us because we know time is valuable and everybody's still recovering from daylight savings. I took all day to recover. Um, but welcome to November's LA HubSpot user group demystifying the HubSpot custom report builder. We have a HubSpot inbound senior prof with us. Welcome, Jory Monroe. Uh, I am SVP here, strategy at MTR Marketing, along with Latal, our CEO, who are running the show. And we also have a special guest, Courtney Sylvester, who is Director of Partnerships at Sales Intel, who will also be um, sharing some more education on reporting and data as we go through this hour. Now, icebreaker. We always do icebreaker. Those of you who come regularly, you know, we always have something really goofy. We just can't help ourselves. So if you want to, um, I would love if you shout it out, but if you want to throw it in the chat, what's your favorite holiday tradition? Thanksgiving is around the corner, but I will also accept Christmas. I think Halloween still goes too. Okay. <laughs> Halloween still goes. I had to think about this, Lata. I don't think I really necessarily have a holiday tradition other than I have now shifted for the past few years having Friendsgiving. So we all meet in one state and get together and everybody does. It's an interesting dinner. It ends up just being a we are the world potluck, but it's a lot of fun. What's yours, Latal? Oh my God, that's fantastic. Green cornflake marshmallow wreaths. <laughs> yeah. They're gross, but like amazing at the same time. And you're green afterwards. And it makes it better that there are kids in my family again, but it's bad. Yeah, everyone should have some though. Kids <laughs> again? That sounds scary. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> now, wait, you have to clarify, Sim. Turkey and sweet potato fries. That just sounds like a plate. <laughs> are, are like the sweet potato fries in the turkey? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a combo combo meal. Um, my um, my cousin's wife makes like these great sweet potato fries from hand. And um, it being with a marinated turkey, it's great. That sounds actually, it sounds really good. Christmas I think vacation. we're going to try that. That might be the only way to get my kids to eat sweet potato. <laughs> Why not sweet potato casserole? I love sweet no, potato. they won't do it. I've introduced that to a lot of Europeans. It's a nice reaction. They look at it, you explain it. They're disgusted. Then they eat it and it's amazing. <laughs> okay, Halloween candy before Thanksgiving dinner while making latkes for Hanukkah. That's, that's everything all in one. <laughs> and watching... Christmas vacation, Friday after Thanksgiving, watching Scrooged and, oh, you like cream bean casserole? Delicious. I think you love it or you don't, but it, it is a tradition. <laughs> it's a yeah. tradition. I just think they made it up as a way to sell Campbell's soup and French's green on French's onions. Okay, Margie, what's, what's your, you like green, okay, you like green bean casserole. I think it's next level, 10 out of 10 casserole. <laughs> All right, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Those are really good. I, I don't know. Those are really good. I love the whole, I like latkes. Okay, Halloween candy and latkes though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, you guys, for participating in that. That's always so much fun. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty, today's agenda. The HubSpot report builder and then a little demo so that we can walk through everything that you will learn. And then Courtney will cover, you know, contact data, keeping it clean for accurate reporting, which we all know is super important. And then as our thank you for your joining us, giveaways and a little survey. Yes, and for anybody who's new here, I think we have a couple who haven't been with us before. We keep things very casual, so feel free. We love to have cameras on if you are willing. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, we love to have cameras on if you're willing. Feel free to keep your microphone on if you have questions at any time. You don't have to hold them till the end. If you're more comfortable in chat, um, Christina will be watching that and will speak up for you. Um, but you are welcome to pipe in anytime you're ready. 
So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Jory, you will take us away. Sounds good. So let me also just Ooh, share I can see everything. Make sure I'm sharing the right screen because I'm perpetually unprepared for that. All right, so I also just note that um, as I'm sharing my screen, I might not see all of the uh, questions in the chat, um, but if anyone wants to like verbally flag, that's also totally fine. Cool, so let's present uh, some updates. So we've got a lot to cover and limited time. So I'm going to dive right in here. Um, as per usual with these hugs, um, brief update before we did dive into your featured presentation, if you will. Um, and that this month is that Gardner announced that HubSpot um, is a leader in the B2B automation space. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, Gartner is a leading uh, analyst firm that on a, I believe it's a yearly cadence, releases what they call the magic quadrant. Now, I didn't make this up, it's really called that. And essentially what it is, is an analysis of businesses that occupy a particular sector or industry or space. And it's a really uh, a way to highlight kind of the key players. Um, since 2015, HubSpot has been on this magic quadrant. Um, and I believe it's kind of popped all over the place, but it is the first year that HubSpot has been recognized as a leader in the B2B automation space. So it's really a kind of a big deal for HubSpot as a company and we're really excited about it. And we hope that everyone, including the partners and everyone in the ecosystem is uh, likewise excited just because um, you know, we've put a lot of hard work into these characteristics, which are why Gardner kind of ultimately recognized HubSpot as a leader. Um, they are as follows, ease of use, um, making sure that the, the platform is always really intuitive for our customer base, a unified data model. This really speaks to uh, making sure that, you know, no matter the product we're building, it's all really working cohesively together rather than the kind of the traditional model where you buy a company and absorb the product. HubSpot's really committed to building all of its products from the ground up, uh, which makes it uh, really cohesive with the CRM and other tools as you build out your tech stack. Uh, marketing execution really involves making sure that we as a company really understand our audience and how we can differentiate for especially small to medium businesses. But over the past couple of years, that's also meant enterprise customers. And then I'm just going to move my face so I can see this final, uh, which is a global ecosystem, um, you know, making sure that we're investing deeply in our partners, in our apps, in our integrations uh, to make sure that the uh, experience is uh, flawless from end to end. Uh, so I have left a lot of notes on this in the speaker's notes, which can be found once you get a copy of this deck. If this is at all interesting to you, it's kind of just like a, yay, we did it guys, um, FYI here. Uh, but to prevent us from sounding too much more braggadocious, um, I will continue on. Uh, that's the main highlight. Um, but now to the featured presentation, which is talking about the HubSpot Custom Report Builder. And this is kind of a sequel to the uh, session that I gave at Inbound, but I'm always so excited to talk about the Custom Report Builder. So as soon as uh, everyone like asked me to dive back in, I was like in a New York minute. Um, so now that I've kind of chatted at you for a while, who am I? Hi, hello. My name is Jory and I'm a senior inbound professor with HubSpot Academy. Uh, if you have interacted with HubSpot Academy at all, uh, you might have found my face talking to you about uh, advertising conversion or HubSpot reporting. And HubSpot reporting is a bit of a pet rock of mine just because I don't find myself particularly mathematically minded. And it is a tool that you can absolutely master um, no matter what your background looks like with analytics or reporting. Um, so I spend a lot of time and energy in the reporting space, but I also teach about advertising and conversion. And to prove that I'm not a robot and absolutely a person, um, I also have hobbies outside of work. They usually involve watching a lot of spooky shows, much to the carriage of my uh, partner who does not like anything spooky. Um, to kind of tee that off as well. I also listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, cooking shows, and you might have already seen her, but I've got a dog, Bellini, who uh, likes to feature in my presentations whenever she can. 
so if you don't know, uh, HubSpot Academy, just another kind of like FYI, um, the team that I'm on is the worldwide leader in free online uh, training involving inbound marketing, sales, and customer service. Give Kyle Jepson and Mary Barba on my team like two months more, and we're definitely going to be uh, diving into the revenue operations and more operations space. So keep an eye for that education. Um, it's going to be amazing. Uh, as a team, we specialize in comprehensive certifications, and um, those are really kind of deep dives on the topic. We also do um, more singular topic courses that are a little bit more high level than you'd see in a certification. And then those one off like quick tactical lessons uh, for professionals looking to grow their career in business. Uh, why do we do the things we do? Uh, we're really trying to transform the way the world does business. Um, and we believe that education is the way to do that. So that's kind of the, the why, how and what of why I'm here today. Um, but it's a great team to be on and uh, part of why HubSpot is so close to my heart. Today's agenda, I tried to slim the fat as much as possible, uh, keep it as concise as we could get it. Um, we're already through that first section, so, so far, hopefully so good. Um, the meat and potatoes of today's presentation, if you will, is really focusing on the report builder. But because some things like associations can get really abstract, I did want to make sure we were capping it with a demo. Um, I'm going to try to aim to get through three to two to three reports in our demo this time around. Um, I have four planned, uh, so if we have time, I'll get to them. Um, but I also want to make sure that I'm here to answer any reporting questions. So I'll be sticking around uh, even after my presentation to make sure that I'm answering any questions that are coming along in the chat. So without further ado, let's dive in. And uh, so today's goal, and I guess it's more of an intention than anything, is I want everyone on this Zoom to walk away feeling that even if you aren't particularly mathematically minded, and if you are, that's great, um, but if you don't fall into that bucket, it's, it's okay. You don't need to be a mathematician or a statistician to really bring data-driven decision-making and reporting to your business to effectively grow and scale. Uh, particular with, particularly with the reporting tool, uh, it's, it's kind of one of those tools where you get like paralyzed by the amount of choices in front of you. But I promise this tool is something that just takes practice and repetition and breaking reports to put them back together. And you will absolutely master it. It's not, it's not something that um, anyone can't get a hold of. Um, and I wanna make sure that everyone feels, feels that way walking away. Um, but speaking of the cust the custom report builder, um, the biggest question that I always get as someone that teaches about the custom report builder and HubSpot reporting in general are what types of reports can I even build in HubSpot? And I feel like this is a really good entry way into the tool, um, gives us a little bit more direction because as I said, there's a lot of choices that are going on um, when you enter the tool. So first up, and potentially the most obvious um, report and easiest report to kind of wrap your mind around are these single object reports. Now, single object reports allow you to analyze, as the name suggests, uh, your objects. Um, so that's your things like contacts, companies, deals, custom objects, activities, etc. These reports are really good if you're trying to find um, how many of something have a particular characteristic. So for example, how many contacts are in a certain life cycle stage or how many deal records have a particular deal stage? How many uh, feedback surveys fall into a certain category? So these are really good for high level kind of scoping questions, um, particularly if you have like a question that's how much of object record has X characteristics? Super easy. Next up, ooh, I'm just flying through. We've got funnel reports. Um, these are both uh, some people's favorites and some people's most hated reports, uh, but here's what you're gonna do with them. So funnel reports are really good if you're trying to understand conversions, particularly through contact lifecycle stages or deals through deal stages. Um, they're really good also if you're a marketing hub enterprise user and you're using events to track particular conversion pathways to see how well traffic is flowing through a specific sequence of events. Again, these are going to be really good for kind of high level conversion analysis on big processes like your sales funnel or your overall lead nurturing process. Um, 
and to get a sense of where there might be outliers because the age old question with funnel reports is do you use any of the life cycle or deal stage or all of the life cycle or deal stage when you build them out. And I would say my advice for using funnel reports is use these reports to get a general sense of how high level processes like lead generation are going, and then actually use them for what they're not showing you. So if you notice that a lot of deals or contacts, for example, are not showing up, use those as outliers to figure out why those particular deals or contacts might not be following the predicted process. And if that's happening more often than not, really dig into the why there. So I think they're really interesting for what they show, but also for what they don't show. Um, and that would be how I would recommend using some of them uh, moving forward. Then we've got like the fan favorite, like these are like the powerhouse reports, which are attribution reports. Um, and you use these to analyze journeys. So um, there's revenue attribution, which is really good for analyzing which marketing and sales events collectively are generating revenue for your business. So if you're thinking things like sales enablement or just answering that age old question, how are my marketing efforts paying off down the road? Revenue attribution is the way to go. Uh, contact create attribution is great for lead gen marketers. It's really going to tell you what are the marketing activities that are generating new contacts and new leads in your system. Um, deal create are kind of like the new kids on the block. Uh, deal create attribution reports are really helpful for determining what's generating new deals. So especially if you're thinking about like lead qualification, like and especially that move from MQL to SQL, deal create attribution reports can really highlight some really interesting insight on what's going well and what's not in that process. Uh, so you might want to consider there uh, to use uh, deal create attribution reports, but you can sort of think about if you if you think about like the buyer's journey as a whole, contact create is going to get show you uh, what's creating contacts, deal create, what's getting people to that stage of talking to your sales team, and then revenue, what's driving home customers. Um, and so like kind of thinking of, of these reports on a bit of a spectrum is helpful, at least for me to visualize like where they can help you in your strategy. But then there's the custom reports. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our time here. So custom reports are for like every other thing that you could be asking in your buckets. So this is about your custom data. This is about anything that the other types of reports like really can't help you answer. And custom reports is sort of like a camera lens, I would say, into your company's data where you can really zoom into granular insights and really start to get through those five levels of why or you can really do high level trends and customize them for date ranges or to show certain characteristics uh, spliced in different interesting ways. Um, it's really kind of that be all end all solving report type uh, to help you get you th the insight you need. But when do you use the custom report builder? Because again, analysis paralysis is definitely a thing. So here are my kind of recommended steps to think about of like, is the custom report builder great for you in the, in this time and in this moment. Um, my caveats of the custom report builder are don't create a custom report if it already exists in the reporting library. And I think this is just an important thing to consider because HubSpot's constantly adding new reports to the reporting library. And you could save a lot of time by just doing a quick scan because you might find it's either in the library or easily customizable from something in the library. Uh, so don't reinvent the wheel, if you will. Um, it's going to be a really good option, though, if you're really reporting on something that's custom, custom properties, custom data, anything that HubSpot couldn't like intuitively account for, that's when you're going to want a custom report. Um, and similarly to kind of that first point, doesn't involve assigning credit to events that occur in a buyer's journey. Um, usually you don't want to reinvent the wheel when it comes to attribution because we have attribution reports. Um, however, I do have a report type that kind of circumvents that point um, where if you are of like, say a professional tier and you want revenue attribution, which is more of a enterprise tier um, event, you could build it out. Um, but really you're just going to want to think about um, kind of the pros and cons of building a report. And you always want to make sure you're effective and efficient with building your reports. Um, so don't reinvent attribution if you don't need to, but you can get around uh, some tiering insights, which, which I will show you how to do uh, in just a bit. 
because uh, the customer report builder is powerful. And if you're reporting on your sales data, great. Um, but some best practices to consider when creating a custom report in HubSpot, just to try to keep it as simple as uh, possible. First up, starting with a reporting question and second, knowing your data sources. So just gonna cover those real quick to make sure we're all on the same page before diving in. And that is to start with a reporting question. So a good reporting question is going to be really essential because you can sort of think of it as your North Star as you head into the custom report builder. It's gonna help you really quickly make the choices you need to make um, when you're building out your report in the, the builder and kind of make sure that you don't go into the builder and you're like, oh no, what, what do I click or what property do I use? Um, starting with a good and solidly formed reporting question can help make those choices for you super simple once you're looking the tool in the face. Um, you have a lot of options at your disposal and the best thing you can always do is just to see those options with a prepared mindset. A good reporting question is relevant and it's structured. So usually I recommend that people think about their reporting questions as immediately tied to a business goal, KPI or core value. This will just make sure that you're not reporting for the sake of reporting um, and then structured. Um, and what I mean by that is it contains an independent variable and a dependent variable. Now, I don't mean to trigger anyone in terms of like, middle school science class like flashbacks. So I'm gonna just keep this like as simple as possible. Should you know what an independent variable is? Sure, it is the variable that represents the quantity that's being manipulated in an experiment. Do I care if you walk away knowing that by heart? Absolutely not. What I need you to be thinking about though is that X is often your variable that's used to uh, represent the independent variable. And that is important when you start to think about how you're gonna lot, like lay your data out on an X and Y axis. So that's why thinking about variables and where they can fall is really important. Um, and key takeaway, X is usually the independent variable when we're talking about questions. Similarly, dependent variable represents a quantity whose value depends on how the independent variable is being manipulated. If that just kind of goes over your head, that's fine. It's a Tuesday. I haven't had enough coffee either. What you really should be thinking about though is that Y is often your dependent variable. And if you take nothing else from that slide, uh, just know that Y is kind of usually that, um, that variable that relies on X to, to have an output but let's see why this matters, right? Like, so I mentioned that it uh, matters when you start to think about what graph you're going to build out in your visual representation, but let's see how this could like actually work in your life. So say you have this question, um, how has your contact database grown over time? Now, if you're just getting started with reporting, translating that to an X and Y axis might seem a little bit much, or it, it might kind of be a little difficult to start to visualize in your head. But here's something to always keep in your pocket. Time is a common independent variable, which means that it's not going to be, it, it marches on. It's not gonna be affected by your marketing strategy. It's not gonna be affected by what you're doing in sales. It's just going to continue on no matter kind of what action you've done. So it's really commonly seen on the X axis. Um, so in the context of our question, how has your contact database grown over time? You would use a create date property to denote time on your X axis. And that would make your number of contacts that are growing uh, the dependent variable that you would start to visualize on your Y axis. So pro tip, time is commonly a independent variable. And if you're trying to think about anything in terms of time, probably gonna go on your x-axis. Let's try another one. How much uh, revenue is each channel driving? So much like time is often an independent variable, revenue is often a dependent variable. So revenue is often going to be on your y-axis because it's usually going up, down, or remaining stagnant depending on the input. In this case, it would be the traffic driven from each channel. Um, so traffic source would be your independent variable and your time or your revenue in this case would be your dependent variable. So if we're thinking about how this would lay on a uh, X and Y axis, um, that's kind of going to be how you're gonna build that report, right? So traffic source on the X axis and revenue on the Y axis could be a great bar chart. 
Uh, and my biggest pro tip when you start to think about X and Y variables and how you're going to build reports in HubSpot is try to get really good at knowing what properties you have in HubSpot. That's the default properties. That's really helpful if you're looking and thinking about date properties is just understanding the defaults. Um, and then also really understanding what you are tracking in terms of custom properties in your account. The best thing that you can do to get ready to build reports in the custom report builder is just know your properties uh, front ways and back ways. Which brings us to data sources. So we've started with our great reporting question, what next? Uh, data sources are a little bit different from how typically HubSpot thinks about objects or event data. Um, data sources are actually both of those uh, data sets together. So it is a grouping of data that reflects information HubSpot is tracking on your business. So in the case of, for example, um, contacts, contacts object data is usually uh, like the, all of the properties you're, you're tracking on your contact record. But if you've been into a contact record recently, you know that there's so much more that a contact record is tracking. And that's usually seen on the timeline, which is your event or interaction data. So what a contacts data source will do and what traditionally the cross object reporting could not do is it couples and pulls together both types of data that is found on the contact object in those contact records. And it allows you to report about the relationship between both data sets. So it's capturing events and object data. So it's a bit more comprehensive than how HubSpot allowed you to report on things like contacts in the past. Um, so it's not quite object, not quite event, usually both. And HubSpot is always adding new data sources or like inputs to the custom report builder in the form of data sources. So as of uh, inbound, this was the full list of data sources that is currently accessible. Since then we've added data sets and there's like a bunch new more in beta. So just know that while these are kind of the sets of inputs that you can start to play with and gather and create your custom reports on, they're always, uh, expanding the amount that you can report on. But these are kind of the, the comfortable data sets right now that are not changing and totally, totally well fully developed. But one thing to know about data sources. So in HubSpot, and this might be a bit of review, but uh, data sources can relate to each other in many different ways. And this is what we call associations. Um, so for example, a deal can be associated with a contact or a company or both at a given time. And that just really helps HubSpot kind of link those pieces of information together. But this becomes really important when you're building HubSpot reports, because when you start to make selections in terms of which data sources you need, um, the report builder is going to rely on these associations to really pull in data. Um, in the custom report builder today, you need to you need to choose your primary data set. Sort of think about it as if you're highlighting that first initial sheet on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, from there, it's going to use these associations to pull in all related data about that primary data set. And as you start to choose secondary data sets, uh, these associations start to matter. So for example, um, usually when HubSpot, HubSpotters are using contact, data sources or the contacts object um, or the products object in their account, those data sources and data sets don't typically talk to each other directly because on one hand, one is tracking the customers that are in your account. And on the other hand, products is usually, usually tracking like the list of your product and services and all of their kind of in associated information. Um, so they don't directly talk to each other. Um, so if you needed to build a report that was involving information about both of those data sets, you hit a bit of a barrier. So to solve for this, HubSpot usually will use associations to bridge the gaps between data sets that don't inherently talk to each other. So in this case, uh, HubSpot would start to find alternative paths and automatically bring in that data to ensure that whatever data source you choose, uh, HubSpot is able to capture it so that you can then go build your report on it. So for example, in the product and contacts example, or 
example, the builder would introduce probably the deals data source to make sure that you could capture whatever information you needed from your contacts and whatever information that you needed from your products and still be able to answer your question uh, effectively using whatever report you then went on to build. So essentially, too long didn't read. Associations really matter. Um, and as you start to think about which data sources you choose, because this is the first decision you usually need to make once you're in the custom report builder, um, you need to start thinking about how your data is connected and um, can relate to each other. So you get all the information you need. And so um, usually just kind of like to peel back the curtain, the builder tries to build the path uh, between the data sources that you chose with as few steps as possible. So it's usually going to rely on the, the big data sources, such as contacts, companies, and deals. But you might see, depending on which data sources you're choosing, a couple more be brought in just automatically into your deal set. And that's usually what the builder is doing, is building those associations. So no matter what you're asking your data sources, uh, you can answer your question. So if you see things highlighted that you didn't click on, don't fear, it's just associations at work. So what happens if you choose some data sources and uh, you notice that there's some, some grayed out areas in your reporting builder? Uh, usually that means that HubSpot, based on the data sources you need and the available associations, isn't able to snag that additional set of data sources. So what do you do if you get to this screen and you're like, actually, I really need ads data to answer my question? My recommendation would be to think about your data, your question, and how it's all associated and ensure that, for example, you might need marketing email uh, just from experience that is the center that is preventing ads from being uh, highlighted. Um, make sure that you need all of the things that you've selected. And if the answer is, I still need all of the things I've selected and something that's grayed out, reach out to uh, a expert in support or reach out to the community um, because we can help you unpack that. But usually what you'll find is that with associations, it's very rare that it will gray out a, a, a piece of data that you need uh, to answer your question. And if you do, um, there's plenty of help along the way. So we're here to help if this ever happens. Um, it doesn't happen very often, um, but just know that if it's grayed out, once you're making your data source uh, selections, uh, it's unselectable moving forward. Um, but you can always change that once you're in the builder as well, uh, if you decide to deselect something like companies. Um, now, as I'm listening back to uh, what I've said, I realized that data associations in this, like we're very much starting to get into like abstract territory, which is why I was like, we definitely need a demo to see how this kind of all pulls together, um, which is why I'm going to show you what I mean by all of this. And we're gonna go into a quick demo of the HubSpot Custom Report Builder and really see how this all comes together. So this is the HubSpot, um, demo portal nothing you see here is proprietary at all so don't worry about like covering your eyes when you see certain things it's totally fake data so to get to the cup the hubspot custom report builder what you're going to do is you're going to go to the reports drop down menu and then snag that reports option um in the past couple of weeks there was the disappearance of the sidebar um the reporting team just kind of pull back the curtain, had been super excited about this sidebar, but then a bunch of the other product teams at HubSpot were like, we want our own sidebar. And so we're kind of currently going through the research of like what should be in the sidebar um, because a bunch of teams wanted a slice of that pie um, and they weren't uh, able to do it so long as reporting and the reports team conquered the sidebar. Um, so that's why that, that option disappeared, just if you were wondering. Um, so once you are on reports and reports, you're going to go to that top right like I did and click uh, create custom report. And this will take you to the first stage of the HubSpot report builder. Um, as we mentioned, there's single object reports, those funnel reports, attribution reports, which is always constantly growing. But we are talking about the custom report builder right now. So this is the first screen that you're going to need to select, which is why understanding how data is associated is so important. You can, you can, um, 
always undo any of the selections you make on your screen, but it's really going to set the stage for the next options that you see in the report builder. So to go back to one of the questions that we reviewed in terms of um, x-axis and y-axis and independent variable and dependent variable, um, how has my contacts database grown over time? This would be a super simple report um, to build if you were just getting started in this tool. So let's build it together so we start to see how all of these choices build together. To answer a how does my how is my contacts database grown, we just need the contacts object, although this other awesome choices would be really helpful. Um, we don't actually need it. So we're going to click next in the top right. And because we've already thought really deeply about our um, question, it actually makes this screen seem a lot less scary. So just to break down what you're seeing here on this screen. On the first column, that's going to be all of your event properties and object properties kind of all pulled together. You'll also see some default measures that are unique to the builder, but are common reporting needs, um, such as count of contacts. Um, this middle column is going to be how you're going to control the report and what the report looks like. And on the furthest to the right column, um, that's going to be your preview of the report. You don't technically need to preview the report, but I would recommend keeping um, that option um, checked on just because uh, it can make your report uh, building and saving a lot quicker and you don't have to like hard refresh it every time that you make a change. Um, but say la vie, if you want to you want to build your report first and then worry about what it will look like, you can absolutely do that. So for our report, how have our, how has our contact database grown over time? We already know uh, that time is going to be our x axis. Um, that's going to be something that's captured in date properties. And typically when you're talking about something like database growth, you're going to be thinking about contact create date. So we're going to drag that over to the um, X axis and um, this search bar, you can you can do the infinite scroll if you want to to find your report uh, or to find your property rather. Um, but I find that just doing the search uh, is a, a little bit quicker. Um, so we also know that since time is our uh, independent variable, uh, the count or the change in contacts is going to be our uh, dependent variable. And so that's going to be captured in count of contacts. And um, wowza, has this demo portal <laughs> grown over time? So you'll notice though, it's capturing all of the data that you need, uh, but also probably some of the data that you don't need. So right now we have a report that shows all of the data that's in our CRM ever. Um, and we probably are actually aren't interested in that, um, which is where this filters tab comes in handy. Um, you can easily add a filter by either dragging over other properties and um, adding a filter, or usually um, it is going to automatically pull in the filters that are related to the properties you chose. So in this case, contacts create date is already here, and we might want to do something like, uh, how has my contacts database grown over the course of this year? Um, so we could easily add in that, um, that filter. Uh, select the date option we need and then click apply. And because I have the refresh checked on, um, that's going to just do it um, and change the visualization as I make those changes. So we have a really good report. How has our contact database grown over time? Well, let me tell you, August was a good month. Um, but this could also give a rise to really interesting questions such as, you know, uh, how has how have those contacts been um like nurtured in the time since that like what's their current life cycle stage and you could break down and start to add kind of additional filters um to to your report to get additional insights so super bummer in this demo portal um, but something that actually might happen um, is you might find that some of your data isn't there and it, it you can't answer the question that you need um, which is why later courtney is going to tell you about the importance of data cleanup um, but if you find that there are huge portions of no value in your crm uh two things you're probably going to want to flag that as a property that needs some cleaning up and um, you uh, can filter that out if you need kind of the available data set 
now. Um, how you would do that is um, filter contacts, in this case, life cycle stage is known, click apply, and it will take that no value option out. So if you need to make a decision today based on all available data, you can make sure you're doing it um, with kind of the data you know on life cycle stage. Um, you could also easily turn this into where did my original contacts come from? Maybe I'm a like lead gen marketer and I need to know which channel was the most effective. Um, you could easily break down and update your report based on additional characteristics. Um, another big report, um, I know that I'm kind of going over time just a little bit, um, so I'll make it to two reports, um, but I will also make sure that uh, the additional reports I was thinking about uh, we'll, we'll get to, um, and I can put some, some cheat sheets in the, in the chat about. But another important report to think about, especially if we're talking about marketing, um, is often something like uh, what, target, what target accounts are really interacting with my, uh, with my content. And I see this as something as like ABM becomes more of a conversation in the market that is really important for uh, companies to know. So how would you change a report like this to such a drastically different question um, if I was not curious in saving this report and sort of starting over? That's where we get to the editing data sources. So remember how I mentioned at any time you can change your uh, data sources, this is how you would do it. So for something like ABM, um, usually it's a best practice to keep contacts as your data source. A lot of questions can be bubbled down to questions about who is interacting with your contacts. Um, in this case, ABM is one of those very uh, particular situations where actually company data trumps a bit of contacts data. All this pop-up is saying is that based on your current report, it's probably going to break it. Um, as we are changing primary data source on a contact specific report, that makes sense. So don't, don't be alarmed if you see this pop up sometimes. Um, but uh, companies are the most important because we probably need something like company name. Um, what about contacts and how they're interacting? Um, so we would uh, need contacts data, but just not as um, primary or not as needed as company data to make sure we're identifying the target accounts that are interacting with us. So all we would do is click apply once we've changed our data sources and the report would probably freak out. So we're going to just X out of our um, X axis and Y axis. And how we could build something like this is we would need the name of the company. Um, this has multiple company name properties in this demo portal, but you will probably only have one in yours. Um, so we would actually not necessarily need uh, a bar chart to answer this question because there are multiple metrics of engagement that a company or person at a company could have. So actually automatically, we know that it's probably not going to be something because there's multiple different types of metrics that can be displayed on a two access chart. Um, so we'd turn this into a table and then we'd add in kind of whatever um, interactions were really important for our company. So we would get that from our contacts data because contacts interact with um, companies and, or with a contacts interact with our content, not necessarily companies. The company's number of pages would be a bit of an aggregate and slightly different from what we're looking for. Um, but we could do, we could measure this based on page views, um, form submissions could be another one. Um, and using this from the contacts property rather than the company's property would allow us, once we start to see numbers, to be able to drill down a little bit more. Uh, as you can see, this demo portal has no numbers seen here, but you would start to see kind of those, um, those numbers start to come in and uh, you'd be able to click on them and get specific insight into who was doing it, which again is why we would wanna do contacts engagement data rather than companies engagement data. So we could see the contact records involved. And then we would choose maybe something like marketing email um, to see engagement um, and marketing email opens maybe a really good flag for us um, to see who's really engaging with our data. Um, so this could be how you would start to answer the question, which target accounts are interacting with my business the most. Um, and I think it's really important to see the um, report builder work in a, a couple of different ways, not just the traditional bar charts, but also um, table uh, 
combination and pivot tables are also really important functionalities that you consider. Um, so that's how you go about uh, editing your data sources and also answering like a more cross object specific questions. Um, but I know that we're low on time, so I don't want to keep you all too much. And I know that Courtney has a super amazing presentation and I want to make sure that we're going to get to it. Um, so I will give you kind of the, the behind the scenes of the uh, other reports that I think are really important to be able to know and sort of build that muscle in the custom report builder. And with that, I will look at what questions are in the chat and stop talking now. <laughs> we actually don't have any questions in the chat yet. Does anybody have any questions for Jory? Brian? Hey, yeah, sorry, I was I was typing as you said that. Um, Jory, question for you. Uh, two, I guess two quick questions for you. Uh, number one, do you think that breakdown by ability will come to single object reports or will it only live in the cross object report builder? Or I'm sorry, so, the custom uh, report builder. So, so it's a good question. Um, I would just say that if it is going to come, it might be a little while off yet just because there's so much attention on the custom report builder right now. So what I would actually recommend is if you are, even if you are building single object reports, do it in the custom report builder, just using whatever single object as your uh, primary data source and then use that breakdown functionality. Because if I was a betting person, I would say that probably some of the single object reports are going to be cannibalized as the custom report builder grows. Um, so I don't, this is just pure speculation, but I don't see them investing a lot of calories into building that functionality into a different subset of the tool. So I would recommend going just directly into the custom report builder. So on a follow-up to that, do you know a potential ETA on timeline for when custom reports that are added to dashboards will be affected by dashboard filters, filters. like date ranges? <laughs> Biggest question I get. Yes. So um, I was told I can't I can't tell you quite the date range yet. Uh, okay. That's still a little internally. I would say, though, if I was to guess a year, it would something that would be needed to be tackled probably more in 2022. Um, I can't say a quarter, but it is the primary focus of the dashboard team right now, um, because I think in infrastructure wise, it's more of a dashboard issue than like the report issue. Um, so it is something that is like their first priority, but they're in order to fix that there are a couple other developer land things that need to happen first, which I just way above my pay grade, right? Um, so it is something that they're really focusing on. Um, but I would say that it's not as it, it's not going to happen like this quarter. Okay. Thank you. Of course. But it is something that we're very aware of. <laughs> it's like such a like, oh, I feel you. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right. Any other questions? Going once, <laughs> twice. Uh, I think you're good. Give me a second, you guys. I lost the slide. Oh no, I did. Okay. Um. All right. So, Jory, I know you're gonna stay with us uh, in case there are more questions at the end. Sure, I am. All right. And Courtney, the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you. I, I promise I, I won't be, uh, I'll be pretty brief here. I know we're nearing the end of time. And honestly, that was such a great presentation, Jory. I, I love the enthusiasm for data and reporting. I, I am someone who is completely self-taught and dives into operations for marketing and sales all the time because I, I actually genuinely enjoy it. I think something's probably wrong with me, but it's the most fun to me. Um, so I work at Sales Intel. We provide B2B contact data. Not here to tell you that everyone needs to work with sales intel. We're awesome. It is a great, if, if you're looking for contacts, you know, please reach out. I'm, I'm happy to walk you through anything. But realistically, one of the things that we end up doing a lot that might seem a little bit counterintuitive sometimes is that we run into issues with just education on, you know, having clean data and why it matters. So a lot of what we end up selling against are just web scrapers. So people who pull emails offline or, you know, just if, if they see that your email is Jory at HubSpot, they're just going to assume that everybody's email follows that same, you know, protocol. And that's just how you get emails. And one of the things that 
we do end up talking about quite a bit is domain reputation. You guys are sending out emails. I, I don't know if you're using it just for market, HubSpot, just for marketing or just for sales. We actually use it for both. So we have HubSpot as well, but domain reputation is something that does really matter. And I know like the first, your gut reaction to a lot of that is, well, I get bounce backs if someone's no longer there. It's not actually the case. So you're not always gonna get a bounce back notification if somebody has left a company or you know, whatever happened or they changed roles, maybe they changed emails. A lot of companies have catch-alls that catch those so they never go anywhere and you have no idea. And why this matters is you know, the more dings you get on your domain reputation, the harder it gets to market to people to have emails that actually deliver. So that's one aspect of this. Um, the other thing that we do end up talking to people about as well is just you're not real. If you're not starting with good, clean contact data that's accurate to begin with, it's going to make everything else you do harder. It's also going to make it almost impossible to track and you're not really going to know what's working or what could have been great, but it seems like there was no engagement because maybe the emails were wrong. So when you're thinking about marketing, when you're thinking about HubSpot, you know, a lot of times you're thinking about segmentation and targeting. So working with, you know, having the correct email is great, but filling in some of those gaps is also important. If you want to target sales ops leaders, or you want to target, you know, marketing operations, whatever it is, you want to make sure anyone you have, you know, as much about them as you can. And it's not just because of segmentation and targeting and getting to those people. You want to use the reporting, everything that Jory just showed you later, because you want to figure out like what's working for which groups. You want as much information as you can. You know, we'll get as granular sometimes as, okay, you know, these types of companies who have this amount of revenue and the, this number of people, they tend to close quicker. So if you're not having a great quarter, you know, you really want to target those people. And if you're really just trying to plan, you know, in advance. And you know that these people do tend to buy, but maybe the sales cycle is significantly longer. You need to plan well in advance for that. So it allows you to not just find someone and call them, but actually then do a full analysis later of what's working, how can you do a better job? And I would also urge everyone to keep an open mind when you're taking a look at this and doing these analyses, you might walk in with this idea that this is definitely what happened. And I know everything about this. This is what the data is going to show. It's often not. I, I speak from experience that I am wrong so regularly about this. And I kind of love it. You know, you have to be open to understand like what the data is telling you about your business. And this all starts from, you know, having that clean data to begin with. So you can trust what you're looking at. And the last point I, I'll just make here, and it sort of ties in with everything is just me measuring your campaign efficacy. If you had an amazing campaign that you spent so much time and effort on, and you're not really sure of the list that you started with, it's going to make it really hard to see whether that worked, whether that resonated. And there are going to be times where you think something did well, and maybe it didn't really, or on the opposite, like you could have, you should be, ch you know, channeling way more money into a certain type of campaign and, and you're not because it seems like there was no engagement. And if you're using engagement as your rule, but you didn't know that maybe half of that list, they're gone or they're no longer at that company, that's going to change how you view things and maybe, you know, alter what you do in the future. So contact data is not just like, I would need to do cold outreach. It's a way for you to really hone in on who to target, when, how, why. And then also, you know, later on, you can, it'll help you follow those people around. So if you work with a system where they're updating people, you can target people who have used your systems in the past for something in the future because you're, you're not starting from scratch at that point if you know where they are now. And that's pretty much it. I'm always happy to answer any questions here. I, I don't want to take up too much time. And if anyone else has questions for Jory or anyone, I want to make sure that you have some time for that as well. Okay. Um, Christina, can you watch the chat if anybody has any questions because I'm sharing my screen and can't see it. Anyone? I'm going to say no. No? But okay. You never know. It's one of those things where when you're done, maybe you'll have that thought. You can just email one of us. I know. Yeah. All right. So now what we've all been waiting for. Dun, dun, dun. Um, 
Okay, so first we want to ask you um, briefly what you thought of this this topic in general. Is this to a topic that is useful for you as far as um, HubSpot custom reports? Um, so uh, feel free to hit the chat or unmute yourself and speak up. Um, also to let you know, in February, we're going to be talking about how to use content in your sales process. Um, and then as far as any suggestions for any future topics you'd like to learn about, we are always open to those as well. Don't try to copy down these um, links, you guys. We're going to put these in the chat if I can figure out how to get to the chat. Um, no questions? I can tell you this is my first go around here and uh, really love it. You know, I don't know what I don't know. So thank you to everybody that shared and I look forward to learning more. Awesome. Um, okay, so for giveaways, um, do you really have one? I think most of you were here last time when we all yeah. got our puzzles. Um, but in case you were not, um, I'm going to put these two links into the chat so this this actually the second link this print faction link will get you a 200 piece jigsaw puzzle that's 11 by 16 of hubspot user groups um, and uh courtney would you like to introduce the other giveaway sure we've also got a couple of amazon gift cards we're going to give away and a sales intel yeti i mean i don't even have one of those so you guys are one-upping me here <laughs> and i will tell you it's very exciting first we thought it was a, a stuffed yeti <laughs> yes. oh i'm disappointed now i think i would rather have that actually <laughs> there, was a, there was a game of telephone that went on and it was just like there I'm was sure. a game of telephone and we used to have a client who had a mascot that was a yeti and they actually gave away at trade shows like these stuffed yetis so when courtney first told michael she has yetis to give away we all thought they were these stuffed yetis like our past clients what a so. disappointment now. I felt like a Yeti was a good gift. And now I'm realizing it's, it's no, bad. this is way better. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay up with a big cup of coffee in my Yeti while I do my puzzle. And then our um, second request, as always, is our feedback form, which is a um, anonymous Google form, just to give us some feedback on how you felt about today's topic and presentation and all the things. Um, yeah, please take a minute and, and fill it out. It's how we do continuous improvement. <laughs> yes. And that's all we've got, unless anybody has some wonderful questions about puzzles or Yetis or <laughs> gift cards <laughs> or holiday traditions or custom reports. I think silence is the new no. <laughs> All right. But thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to join. Really, truly do appreciate it. And thank you to Jory and Courtney so much. Yes. And we likely will not be able to squeeze another one in in December. So wonderful holidays to everybody and a wonderful new year. And we will see you in February. Cheers. Thank you.